C. Speaking as a material scientist and engineer, I see crystal grains, microstructural features a tenth the width of a human hair. But what is this? This is a micrograph of chocolate. And this is a micrograph of steel. It turns out that what makes a chocolatier a blacksmith is what makes you an engineer. What? What does that mean? We're going to explore how food and cooking can be leveraged as really effective case studies to better understand physical phenomena and engineering processes. We've all been taught and probably have a basic understanding of the fact that all matter is made up of the same ingredients atoms, following the same basic rules of physics. How these fundamental puzzle pieces fit together and interact determines everything. And what they're doing on a nano and micro scale affect macroscopic properties that we observe every day. Something as simple as how atoms stack together can drastically change things like mechanical strength, conductivity, melting point, and a panoply of other characteristics. But how can we internalize that relationship across length scales? And how can we manipulate it? Let's consider an analog. A Rubik's cube contains individual repeating blocks, or atoms in a crystal structure, because of symmetrical repetition across all three dimensions. Because of this geometry, we, with relatively little applied external force, can cause rotation in a few different planes. But off-axis, no such luck. A polycrystal is made up of a sea of crystal grains, or extended crystal structures, at different angular orientations, different dimensions, different geometries, and different repeat units as well, potentially. While the building blocks are different, these polycrystalline materials, chocolate and steel, can be processed and strengthened in very similar ways. This is purely because of the universality of crystal structure as a tendency in matter, and the reality that structure plays a huge part in the properties. So how can we control structure? Manipulating what the building blocks are only gets you so far, but processing changes the game. To normalize and stabilize, we do something called tempering. This just means heat treating our materials to make the crystal structure or the types of crystals within uniform. You can see the difference for steel and for chocolate. While tempering chocolate is the Achilles heel for many a baker, tempering steel is a typical manufacturing process and is something you'll hear a lot about in something like knife making. While the composition of these materials stays the same during this process, we as process engineers, through selectively heating and cooling, can facilitate crystal faces we want and eliminate those we don't. This is why swords can be sharp without shattering, why airplane wings can be strong without snapping, why buildings stay upright, but also why some chocolate is shiny with a snap and some isn't. Let's think about what's in chocolate to understand what's going on a bit better. There are cocoa solids, fats, sugars, and an emulsifier, which brings everything together in an emulsion, or a mixture of things that normally don't want to mix. When this mixture crystallizes uniformly, the macroscopic result is a chocolate that solidifies quickly, has a shiny finish, or a smooth, well-aligned surface, and desirable mechanical properties. In other words, it's strong and thermally stable, too. There are intermediate structures that may be stable most of the time, but will phase segregate out under conditions of heat or humidity. In chocolate, this is called fat bloom, and is not that desirable. To avoid this, we temper. Following this phase diagram as we thermally process some chocolate, we can start to see why this is. By melting completely, we can ensure that our solidification is starting from scratch rather than biased toward any pre-existing nucleation sites. Solidification isn't instantaneous, it happens over time as molecules in our melt lose thermal energy and start to glom onto other low-energy molecules. The unstable crystal phase that results in bloom as it decomposes forms pretty easily alongside our good crystals during a simple heating cycle. So this is where we have to get tricky, and one, hold a temperature too high for these unstable type 4 crystals to be maintained, but low enough for these type 5 crystals, the ones we want, to continue to grow. And two, induce the phase we want by providing a template to crystallize around. This is called seeding. Mapping this whole process onto microstructure and macro properties, we can start to see why this works, rather than following a checklist on faith and hoping that our chocolate temper is all right. 
You may be wondering why I've been talking about chocolate this whole time, when there's so much more important stuff going on in the world right now to focus on. And sure, there is. But we as a culture are in the midst of a crisis of confidence with science and the truth-seeking process. And when science feels monolithic and far away, we see trends in dismissal of expertise and disinterest to critically examine reality. STEM education in the US, as it stands now, is far from perfect. Schools do a great job of making real science and real engineering feel lofty and unattainable, while classroom science is dry and mundane. Now, I won't try to convince you that particle accelerator research directly impacts your trips to the grocery store, but we all live in the same world, in a society where problem solving nominally benefits everyone, even if indirectly, and where reality cannot be siloed. We need more people, more kinds of people in STEM, but we all benefit if the baseline familiarity and understanding of fundamental science and the scientific method increases too. But how do we do that if not in school? The laboratory? In other words, the kitchen. As a kid, I was not in love with science classes at school, but I would spend hours at home in the kitchen concocting. I got to build up and flex analytical and critical skills by following recipes, making mistakes, and improvising. What I was doing was building scientific intuition and an appreciation for the scientific method. Even in elementary school, I was learning how process engineering impacted properties. Every time I broke a custard, overworked a cake, underbaked a pie, I was building intuitive confidence and competence that I rely on now as an MIT student and an early career researcher in materials physics. Chocolate tempering isn't the only parallel between real science and the kitchen laboratory. Optical fibers are drawn just like sugar glass or cotton candy. Vulcanized rubber tires work just like jello, and the list can go on and on. The Democratized Science Lab lets us question, investigate, and understand. Cooking can feel like a trivial joy, but it connects people, and it is an opportunity to flex decisive, creative, and analytical muscles. By sharing the joys of a sourdough starter, you can spread scientific literacy and engagement because anyone can cook and anyone can be an engineer. Now is the time to teach and to learn through experimentation.